Uh, very good uh, evening to everyone who is watching this uh, program. This is our uh, astronomy picture of the day by NASA, presented by the members of AST, Astronomy Society of Penang. Or maybe I should say, good evening also, good morning, good day, good night. Uh, let's say you are you are in the North Pole, uh, closer to the North Polar region, it's good night, 24-hour night. Or you are near the South Pole, good day. There's no night, 24 hours day, uh, day all right? So today we are uh, again uh, happy to have our presenters, our Dr. Uh, Jivaraj Nadaraja, okay, and our Mr. I call him now Mr. Rayan Al Kadri, or Rayan, all right. So Dr. Jiva is from Ipoh, and then I'm from Penang, Dr. Chong, and then uh, uh, Rayan is from Kuala Lumpur, capital city. Just to let you know, uh, Penang is is on a uh, island, small island, on the northwestern corner of uh, what they call uh, this uh, uh, Malaysia and our where we are in West Malaysia, we are south of Thailand and north of uh, Java and east of this uh, Sumatra. All right. So today we are going to present the airport pictures. Uh, get ready for the piece. Uh, 18 pictures. Uh, you heard that, Ryan? All right. So I will start with the first picture and share my screen first. Okay. Can you see my screen, uh, Rayan? Yes, I can. Okay, so we are now on uh, 22, 23, 23, October 29, and a nice picture, simple to do. And yet, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Jivaraj and this uh, Rayan, uh, even now, many people have come up with new ideas of putting their pictures. This is a twin, all right? Uh, remember, early this morning, there was a, uh, what I call, annular, uh, no, no, there was a partial solar like a lunar eclipse as seen from Asia, Europe, Africa, and Australia. All right, and this this guy is our uh, Signore Horacio Mezzo, uh, for astronomer, uh, astrophotographer from Sicily. All right, so he took it, and then uh, that this is the picture. So basically, this is only the partial place. Only is a short time. So in Malaysian time, it was this morning, twenty nine of. Uh, September from 2 a.m. Malaysian time to 4 a.m. And at the maximum pace, he took this. So the picture on the left is overexposed picture. They may say, not nice, you know, the bright part, you cannot see anything. No, he wants to over overexpose it so that the bottom part, the, the umbra of the earth can be seen clearly. So the bottom right is the partial pace of the eclipse. The, the bright part is actually the penumbral pace. Penumbral pace doesn't look different from the full moon, huh? And on the right side, it's an instant shot of the in the, uh, in the normal uh, setting, fast ex exposure. And uh, the one on the left is long exposure, so that you can expose on the left side the the umbra of the shadow of the of the earth. All right. So that's it. Now the reason why you do the one on the left is you want to expose the boundary of the umbra on the left. On the right side, you see, uh, the boundary is not very clear. All right. And this is what the in a sense. The, the top is about the north polar region of the moon. The south is the southern polar region of the moon. And you can see here on the right side, you can see here, Sea of Crisis. When I see, I see the Sea of Crisis, and I know this is the northern region. This is the southern region. And I now show now a picture taken our member from Penang this morning. There you are. Wait. Now, I bring it out again. There you are. Okay. So Mr. Kenny Lowe was his sister, Dr. Jiva's sister. Oh, I post screen. Okay, okay. So I, what about now? I, I, I'm not. Wait a minute. Okay, stop sharing. Huh? Okay, let me stop sharing first. Oh, you have to do it again. I see. So we stop sharing. So I go to the okay. So now this one now we uh, okay. Share and touch screen. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. <coughs> 
Can you see the teacher now? Ryan, can you see? Yes. Okay. So now you can see our can you lost picture. So this is a bit different from the early one, the same one. So on the on the top left is the south polar region of the moon, and on the on the bottom right is the north polar region. So it's taken from Penang at the same time, so nice. But um, not many of us were observing because we know that it was most of the time it was actually Punimbro Lunar Eclipse. Only a small part where you have the the full shadow of the earth will touch the southern part of the moon. So I call this what Tikus Makan Cake. The mouse will bite, take a small bite of the moon. So that's the one that Kenny took. All right. So I pass over to uh, to uh, Dr. Jiva to show the next picture and his following pictures. So I will unshare. So Dr. Jiva, you have the floor. All right. Okay. Now let me see if I get this right. Uh, that one was mm -hmm. taken by uh, the sea star. Can you look it with the sea star? S50. Mm -hmm. Uh, wait, now, how do I do the share screen? Yeah, Michael, you help Dr. Yua? There should be a present now button on the Google Meet. Yeah, Google Meet. Uh, uh, with the arrow pointing up. The square with an arrow pointing out inside the inside the square. That's the uh, share screen button. At the bottom of the screen. Okay, all right. Got that. Okay, okay that's it. Mm -hmm. And then you must uh, press, open it, and press share entire screen. Okay, I got it. Got uh -huh. it, yes. Mm -hmm. This one, a lot of interesting picture. We are lucky, this one. Indeed. Okay, have you all got anything there? Not yet. No. Press that button. Bottom, the white box with the arrow inside. Screen. How about now? Yes, something. Yeah. All right. Can you uh, see now? I... You're on? It's a slide. It's a slide yes. presentation. Yes. Okay. So now my picture is the uh, the hidden Orion from Web. Yeah. What date is this, sir? Huh? This is um twenty fourth. Tenth of October. Oh, oh, you you go earlier. Okay. Tenth of October. Are this okay? Is that okay? Is all right. It's okay. Tenth October. Continue. All right. Okay. Now. Um, now, everyone knows the uh, Orion Nebula. Every amateur astronomer knows the um, Orion Nebula. It's one of our favorite uh, things to see. If you look at it, the naked eye, you'll see there's a dot there's a, in the sword of Orion, the three stars that point downwards from the belt. It's the middle one. If you use binoculars, you'll see a fuzzy object. If you use a uh, telescope, a bit more fuzzy, bigger. But if you use a four-inch, scope refractor then you'll be able to see four small stars in the center of that fuzzy object and that's the trapezium now now why apart from being one of the uh, go-to objects for astronomers it's important because it's one of the uh, nearest and closest star forming uh, factories mm -hmm. that's going on in that in that area mm -hmm. so it's a uh, quite a busy neighborhood as you can see from the picture and the caption and uh, the power behind most of it, most of it is fueled by those four hungry stars mm. that are in the center of the nebula. Mm. And uh, this picture, these four stars. They actually much more, but these are the main ones that you can see on a scope. And they are very, very uh, hot, very uh, powerful, and they're just uh, expanding and burning away fuel at a tremendous rate. And this gives off a lot of energy, which causes a lot of changes in the in the nebula around the uh, in the Orion Orion nebula. A lot of changes in the gases there. 
Now, the ordinary uh, pictures that you can see, you can't see anything much. You see something like this is actually a fantastic picture. It's taken, as they say in the caption, in the infrared and near infrared light. But uh, more or less, even with Hubble, you'll only see the visible light and you can't see anything much because the dust and the gases obscure this. Now, the beauty of this airport picture of this date is if you roll your cursor over it, then you see the, the specialty of Webb, of James Webb's telescope. Because then you'll be able to see through the dust into the near infrared, see further into the infrared. And you can actually see behind the dust that obscures the, the light. And what you see is this. Now, this is a vast difference from this to this. If you have the uh, the uh, picture open in your laptop, as you roll the cursor over it, you'll actually see it change in real time. Now, now what does this show? All right. Now, this shows uh, star-forming region filled with purple, green, red, much, much more colors than the previous slides. Now, the purple gases are seen towards the middle. These are actually the uh, ionized gases. And uh, browns and greens are towards the edge. These are the dust, dust particles, and uh, which are towards this, the periphery, which are cooler. And there's a huge fan-shaped uh, orange color at the top, and then fades uh, away to black later on. Now this shows the the beauty of the James Webb Telescope. Okay, it can really look through dust and show you incredible images of. Uh, objects in space. Now we see now this circular area is a cavity. It's actually blown apart by the four for the numerous hot stars in the center. And these blue stuff are the ionized gases from the electromagnetic energy coming out from the stars. And further on you see the shock wave of the dust, dust particles there. Okay. And it's not surprising there's a good star forming area. And apart from that, uh, it also shows a large number of uh, jumbos, Jupiter mass binary objects, according to the caption. Uh, these are not too sure what they are. At the moment, people still look at them as either failed Jupiter objects or probably failed stars or brown dwarfs. Okay. And uh, again, I think the beauty of this picture is taken by the James Webb process by two of the research fellow. Uh, uh, fellows, but the beauty of this shows you the power of the James Webb Telescope compared to Hubble to look deep, deep into the uh, beyond the dust clouds that obscure the this thing and actually show you what's going on behind the veil. Um, I think that's about that. So apart from being uh, an object of uh, interest to most amateur astronomers, the Orion Web is actually a, the Orion Nebula is actually a very interesting object in its own right in terms of star formation. And uh, I think there's a lot of research going on in that that people have written out PhD thesis on, especially the jumbo objects. I think that's about it for that picture. Okay, uh, any comments on the first one then? Go ahead, Dr. Jiva. Okay, um, so that's as far as that uh, first slide is concerned. Now, the, shall I go on to the second picture? Sure, go ahead. Okay. Okay. 
Okay. Now the second one is eleven. Uh, eleven. Yes, that's yes. right. Uh, Okay. Okay, now this is uh, titled uh, Spiral Galaxy with Supernova. And it's also taken in Chile by a telescope and processed by Bernard Miller. Now, it, it, has, it looks fairly straightforward in the sense, oh, okay, you have a galaxy and you have a supernova somewhere then, that's it. But it's quite interesting because this galaxy has got it... Uh, not really, a, I would say, a normal galaxy. I, I don't know whether there's even such a thing known as a normal galaxy. But this is a surface galaxy. It's one of the surface galaxies. Surface galaxies, actually, if you look at them, they're pretty normal, look like normal spiral galaxies. But if you examine the electromagnetic uh, radiation of power that comes from surface galaxies, you find that they are much, much, much more luminous across the electromagnetic spectrum compared to a normal spiral galaxy. They have nuclei which are very, very active, very active nuclei, sometimes powered by a supermassive uh, black hole. And the entire output in the electromagnetic spectrum from this, and this uh, surface galaxy is much more than, as I said before, a spiral galaxy. Now, uh, they are something like quasars, but unlike quasars, you can actually see the galactic structure around the, uh, the, the center of it, the luminous part of it. Okay. Now, NGC 1097 has a supermassive black hole, which is this. It's got a ring of uh, gas and dust spiraling it into, and because of the collision around this area, you'll find a lot of stars being formed in this center nucleus. Okay. And... Uh, these uh, star forming areas are there and deeper x-ray i mean deeper photographs by telescopes have shown four narrow optical jets that appear to come from the center one i guess two three now these jets or these arms these arms are not really from the the, the galaxy itself because they found that they are actually very poor in hydrogen but are very rich in stars and it's being postulated that they actually come, uh, being cannibalized from this galaxy here mm -hmm. by a collection with this. And it's just practically hijacked all its uh, mm -hmm. star fields, star streams into this and left that as a bare elliptical uh, mm -hmm. uh, galaxy. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, this is the small galaxy by the side. Mm -hmm. So you have NGC 107, which looks pretty normal, but it's actually a surface galaxy. It's a very active nebula center and cannibalized star mm -hmm. trails. Okay? So all in all, quite an interesting uh, galaxy by its right. Okay, now what's happening with this galaxy is there's a supernova. This is in last month, according to this airport picture, this is October 11th, yes. sometime in uh, you know, September. A supernova was discovered in the UAE's uh, observatory and later found to be consistent with a massive star probably leaving behind a black hole. Now they do this, of course, by blinking pictures between two exposures taken several months apart. If something say, hey, you know, if they ask you spot the difference between two pictures, that's how you find out. Okay, you now we have a new uh, dot here. And after investigation, they find that, that this is a uh, supernova. Mm. Now, uh, in the caption, it's mentioned the supernova uh, uh, important mm. in nearby galaxies because in trying to figure out uh, this uh, unexpected tension and much debate about the Hubble constant. Mm. Now, I, I wasn't very much aware of this. I went and read up about it. So, it seems that the 
calculated Hubble's constant and the observable expansion of the universe, mm. the expansion rate is much, much more than what if you calculate from Hubble's constant. Mm. And you're not able to figure out why this is, although some say dark matter, dark energy, and so on. So there's a lot of debate going on about this. Mm. So uh, I guess they'll be able to analyze the supernova from different areas and probably measure the distance away and try to come to some conclusion. And uh, now coming back to supernova, I'm sure all you know, Dr. Chong especially, all about supernovas. Uh, there are basically two. One is a huge star, very much uh, more massive than the sun, beyond the Chandrasekhar Bose limit, and when it collapses due to the gravity, the amount of fusion or nuclear reaction is not enough to balance the gravity, and so the whole thing compresses sharply. It collapses into a core and then bounces back. And this provides a shock wave which blows apart the outer layer and giving rise to a supernova. The other one is a, a binary system, usually with a white dwarf and a supergiant. And every now and then, huge masses of matter get sucked into the white dwarf. And it also reignites the nuclear fusion that giving rise to a supernova. Now, the supernova, of course, are important because uh, they provide the higher elements that you find in the interstellar medium, oxygen, rubidium, so on, all the important, the rare stuff are found there. And so this picture is pretty interesting, apart from what is behind it, the galaxy per se, as well as the supernova itself. Okay? And uh, personally, just a digression, uh, there's a supernova in the Pinwheel galaxy uh in may you know, and i had the vespera at that time and I actually caught it of course much later after everybody made a big show about it so i said oh congratulations God, let me go and take a look at it and this is it wow this is picture from my vespera and uh that supernova is there now you know how big is the vespera uh, uh rayon two inches in aperture two inches only Amazing. Two inches, auto, auto focus, auto everything. Like it, yeah, it's yeah. a bit like cheating, but I was so thrilled looking at it. I thought, never mind. It doesn't matter even if you cheated. <laughs> it looks pretty good. This is un unedited, uh, this thing. So, so supernova, it's an interesting picture. This thing, I think. Supernova in a nearby galaxy. And uh, I think that, yeah, that's about it for, on this picture. Yeah. See, now most of the pictures, the previous two, uh, this and the previous two are actually taken by telescopes and the imaging and processing were done by uh, astronomers themselves. My next one would be something more down to earth, which is... Uh, the 14. Yes, the 14. That's, uh, that so nice, so simple yes. the picture, but very nice effect. Show the picture. Yeah. Eleven. Yes, I'll show you the picture. This one. Can you see that? Yes. Yeah. Ah. Uh -huh. So it shows a, a halo, a sun halo. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes we see this. Suddenly we look up. Hey, there's a halo in this uh, around the sun. But in actual fact, if you want to see one, I tried this out. I went out to the garden, put my finger, blocked the sun, and you know what? You can actually see a halo. Uh, the halos are pretty common. You don't usually see them unless they are very, uh, there's a lot of contrast. They are very obvious. But you can pretty well see them uh, almost any time, I think, by just putting a finger, block out the sun, and with a naked eye. But it's a bit of squinting because the sun still shines through the tip of your finger. Uh, they took this picture using a, a smartphone, and it's an artificial uh, occultation of the sun here, and so that you can see the halo around there. Now, how is this form? Okay, now this is sun. That this uh, this chap who did it is an Italian, and uh, he used his finger to block the sun out, and then taking a, a smartphone picture of it. Now. They say that the radius 
angular radius is about equal to the span of your arm, thumb to little finger. Okay, so it's quite it's pretty uh, nice, nice size to see. Now, how is it formed? Okay, now it's formed by ice crystals within the clouds, and this this halo, this this uh, thing here that says. Uh, Circular 22 degrees halos are more, much more often than rainbows due to randomly oriented ice crystals in thin high cirrus clouds. It's also known as a 22 degree halo. Okay. Apparent radius of 20 degrees visible. Also, if it's around the moon, it's known as a moon ring. So on the sun, it's the thing is due to reflected light from ice crystals suspended in the clouds. And uh, it's supposed to be basically hexagonal ice crystals, although there's still some debate about this. And um, now the ice crystals are basically suspend cirrus or cirrus stratus clouds, very, very high up, five to 10 kilometers above the Earth's surface. In cold weather, they can also float down to the ground, but mostly they are very much high, you see, in the cirrus clouds. And they are a type of high altitude clouds ice, made of ice crystals. They are then generally like uh, cotton, not really cotton wool, but streaks. And uh, they form globally in any of these things. So here's an example of a cirrus cloud. These streaks, feathery, wispy little clouds. Okay. They're fairly transparent, like sunshine just goes through it. They form and reform because if the sunlight evaporates the ice crystal, they descend, they get evaporated or sublimate into gas, vapor, and then go up and form. So they never really form rain down to the ground. Okay, so these are cirrus clouds and oscillated. Now, they undergo the ice, the uh, rays undergo a double deflection through the crystals. So forming the ring around here. Now you find that the center part, they don't reach you, so it looks a bit dark. These are the rays that get reflected at the rim. And further on also, they don't get reflected. Even if they get reflected, they don't reach you. So basically you see this part. Okay. And um, you find that there is an inner circle of reddish color while the outer area is bluish. See that. But mostly all I saw was just one rim of light around there with the center dark area and you block this out. Okay. Okay. So it's a very nice picture, very well taken, good focus, and it just shows this beautifully, beautifully. Okay. So that is the uh, halo around the sun and you guys can go to the sun next time and then try uh, blocking this and getting a look at it. Okay. My other picture would be uh, yes. Okay. Um, Twenty fourth, show the picture. Twenty fourth, okay. Now the picture is very nice. Now this is it. Yo yo, incredible, incredible. <laughs> oh my, I tell you, incredible. It's taken by uh, Abel and uh, processed by an Indian chef, an amateur astronomer actually. So he did a lot of processing on this. But just look at it. It's it's, it's fantastic. And uh, it's actually two galaxies colliding. Now, first, it, it's, a name, it's a funny name. It's Up, Up 87. I mean, you heard of Messier, Colwell, and then uh, the NGC, New Galaxy, the same. But Up is something different. And it's actually an atlas of peculiar galaxies. Hmm. It's the Halton Up 1966, total of 338. And they just wanted to show different kinds of funny galaxies, you know. But uh, apart from the, the strangeness and the beauty of it, 
there's actually a lot of things going on inside there which are exciting uh, astronomers these days. Now, you see uh, now two large galaxies uh, uh, tearing into each other, and there's a bridge that passes between them to show that material is being ripped and pulled from uh, one to the other. And uh, there's an interesting picture, as you see on this. Uh, this one. So you can see material being pulled there and just being ripped off. Uh, this uh, edge on uh, spiral there just doesn't seem to be taking part in what's going on here. It's just coincidentally in the same frame. But this looks like that. And you see that due to the disruption in the galaxies, there's a lot of uh, gas collision, debris collision, a lot of hot blue stars being formed here. And this arm going there and spiraling around that. Now, although it looks unusual, it seems that uh, galactic mergers are quite common. And sooner or later, we are going to collide with Andromeda. And then you'll have something like this kind of uh, picture going on. Okay? Now, this ARP87 is found in the constellation of Leo. Now, there's an interesting thing is this, this particular thing. This is known as a polar galaxy, where there's a ring of star and dust circling uh, the spiral galaxy at perpendicular or right angles at an angle to the plane of the galaxy thing like that and this is known as a polar galaxy hmm. and uh, orbiting in rings perpendicular plane of the flat galaxy this is uh, supposed to be formed when two, galax uh, two galaxies either collide with each other one passing through the other one at an angle or passing by and material being ripped apart and forming in this uh, ripped apart and forming a ring around the galaxy Here's another one which you can see of a polar galaxy. This one with the ring of the thing around that. So coming back to this picture, it's a wonder. You can just gaze at it for hours and uh, so many things to look into it. But uh, it's just a very interesting picture by itself. Now. No, I think that makes up uh, the four pictures that I have to present. If um, anyone would like to have any comments about the pictures on their own, maybe share some new information. I pass this back to you, uh, Dr. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Chong. Okay, ah. okay, so there is a question from uh, Yaya Sophie Hussein. She asks whether, with reference to the halo effect caused by the ice crystal, is this phenomenon possible in a dry desert weather? Uh, yes, I think because uh, it doesn't really matter about the temperature or humidity low down. Cirrus clouds are very high. They are global phenomenon and you get cirrus clouds practically anywhere along the globe. So I wouldn't be surprised if we get a uh, hello even in deserts. Okay. When I, when I was looking at that halo, it looked as if someone was, it looked like a reflection, like someone was touching the water and there was a ripple coming out. Mm -hmm. Beautiful phenomenon. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is my screen visible? Yes, can see clearly. Can you see the astronomy yeah. picture of the day page? Yeah, but the phone the phone size is a bit small. Okay, I'm going to, let, let me get into the image. Um, the first image I'm going to go through today is from October 23rd. Give it some time to load. As Dr. Chong said, we do have a lot of very nice pictures. Yeah, yeah. 
this month. Uh, and this you, 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 one, you said that, man. let me zoom yeah. out well so we can really capture what's going on here. Can all of you still see the image? I here? thought it was the latest uh, pizza they're selling. <laughs> <laughs> well, pizza has something to do with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, let, 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 let's see. Um, this was, okay, just about two weeks ago, um, October 15th. Juno Camp captured this majestic shot. Fantastic. Fantastic. Isle. Now, to understand what's really going on here, um, let, let's go back in time. You see, four billion years ago, when the solar system formed, but, you know, that's, that's too far. Um, let, let's maybe go back to 7th of January, 1610. Mm. Uh, an accomplished 45-year-old musician looks through his personally built telescope, and he observed three stars around the planet Jupiter. The next day, he realized one of the stars was actually the combined light coming from two stars. This piqued his interest, and he continued observing them over the next few days. Now remember, at this time, the general consensus was that every celestial object, and I mean every, from the moon to Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, all the stars, even the sun, orbited the Earth. By January 15th, this man realized that those four stars weren't actually stars. They were satellites. And to make things worse, he realized they weren't even satellites of Earth. They were orbiting Jupiter. These things weren't orbiting Earth. Now, some of you may know who I'm talking about. This man wasn't just a musician. He studied medicine, later switching to mathematics and natural philosophy. He also studied the fine arts, becoming an instructor at the Academy of the Arts of Drawing in Florence. His name was Galileo Galilei, and the four objects he observed would become known as the Galilean moons, naming them Jupiter 1, Jupiter 2, Jupiter 3, and Jupiter 4. Now, at the same time, another astronomer, um, Simon Marius, independently observed four moons, and after talking with a familiar name, Johannes Kepler, Marius to name them after decided to name these four moons after the irregular lovers of Jupiter, who is the Roman version of the Greek king of gods, Zeus. The largest moon in our solar system, Jupiter 3, was named after Prince Ganymede. The most cratered moon in our solar system, Jupiter 4, was named after Nymph Callisto. And of the two moons that Galileo first thought to be a single moon, Jupiter 2 was named after Princess Europa. And the most volcanically active moon in the solar system, Jupiter 1, is named after Priestess Pharonis, mm. usually referred to as Priestess Io. Mm. Over the next few centuries, you would study these four moons. And finally, just 401 years after Galileo's discovery, NASA launched a spacecraft to observe Jupiter and its moons, reaching orbit around the gas giant about five years later in 2016. And for a spacecraft that keeps a 24-7 watch of Jupiter and his lovers, who better to name it after than Jupiter's wife and sister, Juno? The one person capable of peering through Jupiter's clouds of mischief, revealing his true self. Mm. And that is exactly what we have here. It's not of Jupiter, no, but it's a shot of Io from the Juno cam, Juno's visible light camera. Um, this was when Juno was just 11,645 kilometers from the surface of Io. That's the closest Juno has ever gotten. And visible in this image, in this image is the brownish orange that fills Io, a result of the sulfur and sulfur dioxide from its predicted 400 active volcanoes, 150 of which have been directly observed by spacecrafts like Juno. Now, one of the volcanoes actually erupted just as Juno passed by. And we can see its faint plumes right here. I'm going to have to zoom in for this. We can just barely see the plumes right there of the volcano. Can see, of, can see. Yeah, yeah, of the volcano that just, that just erupted. I'll zoom back out so we can see, see this whole thing. Um, now, Juno does have uh, two other flybys planned, one in December and another in January during which it will reach close to a thousand kilometers above the surface of Io. So do stay tuned because anything we learn from these images will probably be shared here on APOD. So here we have 
Moon, Io, from Spacecraft, Juno. And the various credits here are given to the organizations involved and the people part of the processing and copywriting of, of the image. Okay. Um, oh, and very quickly, for the purpose of a size comparison, this is how the four moons, um, the four Galilean moons compare to each other. This is not to scale with the Earth one, however. So there's, imagine an invisible line right here uh, that separates them. If you want to have a comparison between Io, the moon, and Earth, that's the image up here. So yeah, it's a big moon with a lot of volcanoes. Now on to my next image. Now this one, <clears throat> This one's not so far out, out in deep space, no. This, well, for this, I'd like to introduce you to one and only Gandalf the Gas and his incredible flying apparition. Mm. I mean, that's what I thought when I saw this. The photographer, however, a Mr. Yuichi Takasaki, thought it was perhaps the goddess of the dawn. Whatever it was, though, it crept up one early morning in 2013. You see, takasaki san watched the vast skies above Alexandra Falls and the Northwest Territories, Canada, waiting to see his love. According to the World at Night, um, which is where this T-W-A-N here is, uh, you can see in the image credits we've got Yuichi Takasaka um, and T-W-A-N, the, the World at Night. According to the World at Night, Takasaka has and intimate love affair with the girl named Aurora Borealis, the magnificent lights of the northern skies. As expected, the solar rays here colliding with the oxygen in the atmosphere results in this green hue of what some might say is a menacing monster, but is actually one of nature's many violent yet beautiful spectacles. Yes, as we can see here, Ghost Aurora over Canada. It can call, it, I've seen a lot of ideas of what it is on, on the APOD forum, and, and it gets creative. Um, so do leave your thoughts of what you think it is down, down in the comments, because this is truly a magnificent sight. So maybe the, the guy can also have taken at the same time the radio signals from Aurora. Aurora deep of radio signal. And you, That's true, uh, yes. you, you, you can play it. And they have an eerie sound eee, together with a picture. Singing, the singing goes all over. Yeah. <laughs> that would be even better. Okay. I have four more images that will be coming up after this. But for now, I will pass it over to Dr. Chong. Thank you, Ryan. Okay. So my next picture is for uh, 21st of October. This one. Oh, yo. Nice. Now, this is not the latest. Uh, uh, decoration to a, a, a sitting room of a person with the tiles. These are not tiles, huh? These are all quarter moons. Now, basically, on the left, all the uh, on, column on the left are the first quarter the moon. Remember? Sorry, As, yes. Uh, wait, sorry. I will, let me share. Let me share. Yeah. No problem. It, it sounds very exciting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, can you see it, uh, Ryan? Uh, yes, we can. Okay, so uh, this uh, is for the uh, 21st of November, uh, called Quarter Moon, taken by our uh, Marcella Giula Passe. It's an Italian woman, all right, who took it uh, from uh, Italy, and she's actually an astronomy and atmospheric optical phenomena. So she looked for interesting uh, uh, optical phenomena in the sky and took it. And look at it. This is not someone's uh, latest tiles on the in the sitting on, on the floor of the sitting room, like quarter moon. So the the column on the left is first quarter moon. The second column on on, on from the left is our third quarter moon, followed by first quarter and so on and so on. And let's look at enlarge and look at the details. Huh? It's all in, indicated there. For example, the first one is for January the ninth, the ninth, taken last year. The whole set is taken for whole of last year. All the first quarter moon and third quarter moon from Italy. And following on the 
the column on the left after that is April the 9th, June the 7th, September the 3rd, and then November the 1st. And then for the third quarter moon, the first one on top is January the 25th, March the 25th, and so on. And the way she arranged it, she's very artistic. There you are. All right. So basically, as the as the earth, the the moon orbits the earth in one lunar month, you have the four important phases. Okay, which are the for example, you have first quarter moon, full moon, third quarter moon, followed by the last phase, which is the old moon. And the cycle repeats. So how how many how long has the moon orbited the earth? As long as the earth is here. So we remember we know that after the Apollo missions, the American astronaut brought a lot of moon rocks back to the Earth. And he found that the moon was created from a collision of a mass-sized object with the Earth. And that's how the moon was formed, by collision of a mass-sized object with the Earth years ago. Right? So this is by our Marcella Jula Passe. The next one should be on the 19th of October. Enlarge it. The name is a sunrise at sunset point. All right. Remember recently on 14 of November there was a, a annular solar eclipse that occurred over America, and there's a place called Utah, state of Utah, and there you have a, a canyon called not the Grand Canyon, Bryce Canyon. All right. And this is uh, looking at the east. And when the sun rose in the east, the, that whole morning there was an annular solar eclipse. So let me enlarge it even bigger. Big, 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 big. There you are. And is it clear? Not clear. Bigger some more. Uh, you see at the central part, part is actually the ring of fire, all right? Where the moon, as seen from the earth, is quite small because the moon is at LG, and then the sun is actually uh, bigger. Okay, because the Earth is at perihelion, so the 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 the, mm. the moon will cover the sun, and then this is the annual solar eclipse. Uh, this is the beginning of the eclipse and eclipse. So mm. basically, uh, it's taken by our famous Martin Blackleaf. I've been following, I've been subscribing to Astronomy Magazine, American Astronomy Magazine, for many years. He's the one who regularly contributes a night sky column, Astronomy Magazine. So he went there. Uh, so basically, every two minutes. Uh, yeah. His camera took a picture of this annular solar every yeah. two minutes. And at the end, he composed it. Uh, it's, it's not a time lapse. He took every two minutes and put all into one picture. And this is facing east. So I repeat, this is a sunrise at sunset point by Martin Rayclip. So nice, you know. And by the way, we have been showing a very interesting pictures just now by our Dr. G. Varash and uh, Ryan and myself also. Basically, then each time I look at, I think about the whole thing. I'm very amazed, you know, amazed by what our universe. We have seen over the past so many years, since 2020, all this type of phenomena that occur in the galaxy, in the solar system, and on the Earth. They basically can only be described by three laws. If, if you ask me, uh, that is it the universe is so beautiful because there are many laws to make it so complicated. That makes the diversity in the universe. No, the whole universe can be simplified to three natural forces, right? The strong nuclear force that binds the protons and neutrons and the quarks into the nucleus of the atoms. And then you have the, uh, what you call, weak nuclear force that also in the nucleus, which gives up the, the alpha, beta, gamma radiation, all right? And then you have the, uh, the, the third force, which is the electromagnetic force. The force that is attracting the electron around the nucleus. And the fourth one is gravity force. But years ago, the scientists were able to combine the second and third force. So basically now you have three forces, natural forces in the universe. The strong nuclear force, the electroweak force. You see the electroweak force was the weak nuclear force and the electromagnetic force. But now it's the electroweak force. And the third one is gravity. All right? So basically, all the beauty of the universe <coughs> that means explaining for the past few years can be described by three forces. If you ask me, can we simplify even further than three? Yes, that's one. Gravity. So in some of, not the uh, textbook, in some of the common uh, uh, 
popular articles for astronomy, they say like that. The story of gravity is the story of the universe. Because if you ask me, right from the the moon orbiting the earth, the planets orbiting the sun, the stars in Milky Way orbiting around the center of the Milky Way, and the Milky Way orbiting around the cluster of galaxy, and so on. So what is of course involved? Gravity. So basically, gravity will define many of the major phenomena of the universe. It can simplify to one. But if you go into a smaller scale, there's a three forces. So these three forces I mentioned earlier, strong nuclear force, electric force, and the gravity force, can bring out so much richness in the universe. And I'm always amazed by this fact, you know. Okay. So now we go to the, to the next picture, which is on the 17th of October. Okay, uh, let me read the name first. PDS 70, a star, all right? And then you have the this planet and moon, okay? Smaller. Okay, so the star is over here. So uh, PDS 70 is a star here. And then you have the this, which is uh, accretion disk orbiting around the star. And then you have planets. Planets is here. And this is the moon. All right. So basically, it's by our Alma. Alma is Atacama, last, um, uh, what do you call it, millimeter, sub millimeter array in Chile. All right. It's actually a radio telescope of wavelength, millimeter wavelength, or sub millimeter wave. Sub millimeter, millimeter means less than one millimeter. And so by ESO, European Southern Observatory, NAOJ, and Japanese, but we're proud of NAOJ. It's a National Astronomical Observatory of Japan. And then the American NRAO, National Radio Astronomical Observatory. So these are all in what radio wavelength, but in short wavelength, all right? Uh, a bit longer than infrared, sub-millimeter wavelength. And it's by our Miriam uh, Benisti, all right? The article written by her. She's actually a radio astronomer from, from France uh, in Grenoble. I got my PhD from Grenoble, no? So she actually... Uh, it's from from this uh, Grenoble, and you see the word below there, AR. So, so many of our Malaysians don't know to say et al, et al, no. It's actually AR. AR is Latin for and and etc. So she's the main author, and her group of researchers with her is called AR. If she gives out the group of researchers, it's too long. So it, uh, M Ministry AR. Okay. So basically here you have a ring here. Okay orbiting around the star and uh, the astronomers have found that there's another uh, clump of gas here or dust here and according to them given time this will collapse and form three moons right uh, orbiting around that star right pds so i understand pds is is a name of uh in 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 spanish huh? and uh, what they call is in the constellation of centaurus all right so this is our PDS 70, the disk, the planet, and moon. Okay, so the next one is I pass again back to Rayan. Rayan, I pass it back to you. Yeah, okay. I shall present once more. Um, a couple more images this time. Okay. Well, actually, before I present, before I share screen, the next few images that I'm going to cover, I'm going to stop presenting for a while. The next few images that I'm going to cover have to do with a certain effect. In fact, the next three all have to do with this effect. And that effect is something called um, the annular solar eclipse. You see, among last month's APODs, and even the first APOD presented tonight, we had a look at a lunar eclipse. Um, that happened when the, well, last month it was when the moon was at its perigee, but lunar eclipse is basically a full moon um, opposes the sun with respect to the Earth, and so the Earth casts its shadow on the moon. The next few images, however, 
has to do with a solar eclipse, where a new moon passes between the Earth and the Sun, temporarily blocking the Sun's light. Now, sometimes, due to the distances involved, the moon would completely block out the Sun's light. This time, however, in part because the moon is at its furthest point from the Earth, because it's so small and due to the angles involved, the moon only partially blocks the Sun's light, specifically around the center. This we call an annular solar eclipse. And what we're left with is basically a ring of fire surrounding the new moon as it passes between the sun and the earth um, to provide something of a visual of what I was just talking about. I'm going to share my screen. Before we get to the image, I'm going to play this little animation. This is from NASA. Okay, can, can is this screen visible? Good? Okay. Okay. Yes, so, yes, visible. So here we have the moon's orbit around the Earth. And you can see that it's it's an oval, it's not a circle, which means there is a perigee. You can see the perigee is when it's closest to the Earth. And that's when you get during a full moon that would become a super moon because it, it's larger than usual. At the same time, we have something called an apogee. That is when the moon is furthest. And you can see how small the moon looks when it is far away. Now that's important because, yeah, a little spoiler there, but the orbit of the moon around the earth is at an angle, as you can see here. It's not on the same plane as the sun and the earth. Because of that, the moon doesn't always pass within the earth's shadow of around the sun. So you can see here, what we're looking for in a solar eclipse is when the moon is around here. If it's too high above the Earth, nothing's going to happen. If it's right in the middle and it's at right, just the right distance, it will completely block it out, which we'll see in a moment. But if not, if it's at just the right angle, just the right distance, we get the annular solar eclipse. So you can see here, it has to be an apogee when it's furthest away, because only then do we get this effect. So nice, so nice. Yeah, so, so, so this is... Um, basically a comparison on the right, total solar eclipse, on the left. The Earth. ring of fire. Yes, the ring of fire. Um, in fact, this image here sort of provides you a little uh, background and understanding of the terminology used. When you say partial, it, it, the Earth just barely blocks out the light from the sun. Um, total completely blocks out. Um, annular, we have, as Dr. Chong said, a ring of fire. Which brings me to my first A bar wow. for this list. So <laughs> nice. Sunrise eclipse. Yes, it, 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 it is absolutely nice. Now, <clears throat> these events, they are quite rare and depend on where you are. The most recent one um, was, was October 14th. Um, the next one in Malaysia is going to be in 2031. As for the rest, as for the entire world, the next one will be 2nd of October 2024, with it being mostly visible in the Pacific Ocean and the South of Argentina and Chile. Um, so, yes, the most recent one and what most of my pictures uh, tonight will be about is the October 14th eclipse, which was visible across the Americas. So, the US, Mexico, Colombia, Brazil, they were all able to see it. My first Ring of Fire A pod for tonight, though, was not. This one that you're looking at here was not from October 14th, primarily because you'd have to be a time traveler for your October 14th, 2023 image to make it as the October 9th A pod. So, yeah, it's not off the same um, annular solar eclipse, but it was off a an annular solar eclipse. Um, this one here was taken at the end of 2019 by, let's see the name here, let me scroll down, by Elias Hashiotis. Yeah. He was over in um, Al Wakra, just south of Doha, Qatar, when he captured this annular solar eclipse. So it was from a different place in Earth, one where instead of a ring of fire, we get more of a crescent of fire. Because from here, the sun doesn't completely engulf the moon, perspective of the place where he took the image from. Still, it makes for a once-in-a-blue-moon sight. 
Coincidentally, it is just about as rare as an actual blue moon. Anyways, to further distinguish this image, we can also observe the Omega Sunrise, or Etruscan Vast Effect, where the reflection of the water here causing, uh, ca causes the setting sun, to, well, rising sun in this case, to appear part of an Etrus Etruscan Vast, as made in the 7th to 4th centuries BC by the Etruscans of ancient Italy. It also resembles the Greek alphabet Omega. Yeah, so if, if you have, if it's the full sun, you will see how these, these legs down here sort of resemble the legs of Omega over here. So we call it the, the Omega sunrise. So combining the crescent of fires, Omega sunrise created what Kyrgios Hashiotis here called the most stunning sunrise of his life. And I can't argue with him there. Okay. The next wait, wait, uh, 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 Ryan, I, for me, the first I saw it, I wanted to give it a new name for this picture. It, it's as uh -huh. if a sea monster from the sea is rising up with two horns and going to go after the boat. <laughs> so to me, it's, watch out, the sea monster is going to get you. <laughs> That's my title. That's a nice one, yeah. yeah Especially with the of this shit there. That, that is a nice one. Yeah. <laughs> that devil with two horns. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, the next one here, again, also has to do with the analyst solar eclipse. So I'm going to have to zoom out here. As you can see from the title, an eclipse tree. Um, this was taken by Sean Wire in Burleson, just barely northeast in Texas, in the United States. And we have yet another combination of effects. This time, instead of water reflecting the eclipse, we have the gaps between the leaves of a tree projecting the image onto the ground. For those unfamiliar, this is the same principle behind pinhole cameras and why no matter what shape you poke or carve through an opaque board, if it is small enough, it will end up projecting the shape of your light source. Of Ryan, can you enlarge the picture? Sure. Can you see in more detail, enlarge the picture, the question? Yeah, very nice, very nice. Voila. Okay. So what's basically happening with the pinhole camera effect is that due to the small gap for the light to pass through, only certain photons traveling in just the right direction pass through. They'll start from one side of the light source, say the right side of the sun, travel through the gap and end up on the other side of the, on the surface of the projection. So it would end up on the left side on the ground. So our eclipse here is actually both upside down and left side right or mirrored. Think of it as if you're in a noisy house talking to your friend. Uh, you're not going to hear them well, but if you enter a room in that house where it's just you and your friend, by limiting the amount of sound, you now more easily hear your friend. It's not a perfect analogy, but that's the main idea here. In addition, unlike what you normally see as a projection of the sun on any other day, the eclipse here is very clear. Um, I mean, we, we can look at this and we can very clearly make out the crescents here. Why is that? Well, it comes down to two reasons. Primarily, A, there is less ambient light during an eclipse, unlike on a sunny day with bright blue sky, uh, provides a lot of ambient light, hence reducing the clarity. And also because B, there is literally less light coming from the sun because the moon is blocking it. Look at any shadow and you'll realize the further or brighter the light source is, the less clear the image. But the closer, or in this case, less intense the light source is, the less light you actually have going through your passageway, the clearer the image becomes. So the next time a uh, solar eclipse, primarily an animal, eclipse appears, make sure not only to look up at it, but also look down at its projection. And of course, if there's a strong wind blowing, you can see the dancing solar crescent on the ground, the dancing solar crescent. Yeah, take a video. Nicely. Now, 
I did rearrange my presentation of the AIDS yes. Uh Ray, yeah, before we continue, there is a question from Yaya again regarding actually the same pictures of the annular solar eclipse. She asked whether the image will look the same from space. The image of the annular solar eclipse from space, okay. It would it would depend on where you are in space, at least based on my understanding here. If you are at the right, if you're at the right angle, um, you would be able to see the moon passing through the sun. It may not look exactly the same as it does in the in the images, but you would be able to see the moon passing um, between the Earth and the sun if you're at the right position. The ISS, for example, is moving very rapidly around the around the Earth, so. When we talk about staying in the right position, that would not be the easiest of tasks, but I, I suppose it, it should be possible. In fact, uh, more, another interesting question you can ask is, now you are looking at the annual solar eclipse as seen from Earth. So mm -hmm. during the time when the, when the annual eclipse or solar eclipse occurred, what about the sight of the Earth as seen from the moon? During this eclipse, annual solar eclipse, when the, you are someone is on the moon looking at the earth, how would it look like? Uh, you can ask, ask yourself how to answer the question. It's okay. So, Ryan, yeah. you can continue. That, that, that is a very good good. No, I always ask myself during a solar lunar eclipse, we see from the earth what happened to the sun or the moon. What about you on the moon looking at the earth? And you'll be very surprised, you know. The answer will be very surprising. Imagine you have, a, let's say, that, uh, this annular solar eclipse, you're on the moon looking at the earth. So, what's going to happen? On the earth as seen from the moon okay i, I mean I, I would imagine we're looking at a version of a lunar eclipse but instead of but the earth and the moon being being swapped so you'd sort of see the moon's shadow across the earth which would be an interesting sight yeah 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 yeah, yeah. something for future moon travelers to look forward to yes okay this is very nice who is you it, it is. It, it really is. Um, I purposely put this as my last for the annual solar eclipse because there's not much in terms of information that I want to cover here. Um, the person on the left is Gary Zhang. The person on the right is Andrew Zhang. The photographer's name, um, let's, let's zoom in here on the, is, is, is Baolong Chen. But what's going on here? Is what the real is what the image really is about. First off, this is the first of my images that properly shows you the ring of fire, and yes, that is that is the, the whole ring of fire in its entirety. And you see, annular solar eclipse is named as it is because annular comes from the word annulus, which means basically ring. And in any other annular solar eclipse image that would be the one and only ring. In this case, however, it happened not to be the one and only ring. Um, this was in the early mornings of October 14. This happened over in, in Lake Abbott in Oregon. The, this couple here knew that they were going to go there, snap a few pictures. She, they, they, had, they spent hours to set it up because they knew they'd only get a short span a few minutes in which they could really capture the annular solar eclipse and she amber here saw her friend uh, 400 meters down the ridge with the camera set up and everything everything was already everything was prepared but perhaps the thing that she wasn't prepared for was the question that he ended up asking when he knelt down on one knee and it could have ended up being a very tragic story um, but it's not that kind of story. It seems to be the more romantic type. She said, so, yes. Uh, Ryan, did he add on? Has he, is he proposing to the girl to get married? Yes, he Agreed. is. That's what this was. And if yes, she agreed, it'd be happened. wonderful. And yeah, she did. She, her answer was yes. Yeah. So, I mean, they knew that the next annual solar eclipse is going to be 16 years later for the US. So, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping 16 years from now, they take another <laughs> shot re reenacting this and upload it onto APOD. I'm, yeah. I'm pretty sure the guys would be, would be more than happy 
to, to let it be the yeah. end. And 16 years later, the man, the man will carry one one child on the hand, and then the woman right. will carry another child on the other hand. <laughs> Four of them in the next eclipse. Yeah. Great. Uh. Definitely something to look forward to. Yeah, yeah. Very nice. So not so much on the information here, just the beauty of, of this really one of the most romantic apods of I've ever seen. Um, which is why it's not easy to to pick up from. Um, that's why I didn't think any of my other four A pods would be able to pick up from this. Which is why I had to have this last one to be the one to pick up. It's not as romantic. It actually is rather boring to those of you who aren't familiar with it. But it was monumental. Truly, truly monumental. Courtesy here to the Carnegie Institution for Science. Um, the title says quite a lot. Edwin Hubble discovers the universe. Now you might be thinking, what discovers the universe? We already knew that we were living in the universe. Uh, yes and no. Let's, let's picture something. It's April 26, 1920. The Smithsonian Museum of Natural History is only 10 years old, you know, the one the, the museum in Washington, DC. And a great debate is being held. Albert Einstein is there. You rush into the debate hall and it's already begun. On one side, there's Harlow Shackley, a 34 year old who went to the University of Missouri for journalism. Um, but when journalism was postponed, he went to the course directory and picked up the first subject he could see. The first happened to be archeology, span which he could not pronounce. So because of that, he went with the second, which he could pronounce. And that ended up being astronomy. After graduating, he earned himself a fellowship at Princeton and his graduate work was to determine distances to globular clusters using the groundbreaking work of Henrietta Swan Leavitt. And through his work, he concluded something. He concluded that the Milky Way was very big. In fact, these, these scales were so big that most astronomers would agree no, no galaxy would be able to be, to be that big. Even terms like galaxy weren't really used at this time because this was before galaxies. Yes, this is back in 1920. It was before galaxies. You see, you see there were nebulae who, that have been referred to as island universes, basically something separate from our own Milky Way. And Chaplin here, his argument was that, no, the Milky Way is so, so big, everything we see in the night sky must fall under it. And he ended up being right about certain stuff, but the main argument here was about those island universes. So on one side, there's this Shapley chap. On the other side, there is a well-respected and well-known orator. His name was Heber Doust Curtis. He was 48 years old. He studied astronomy in the University of Virginia. And eight years prior to the, to the debate, he became president of the, astronomy, of the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. He was an opponent to Einstein's general relativity, but his main argument pertain to this was that, well, these island universes, they aren't actually part of the Milky Way. They are separate from it because of the, the distances that would be involved. And for long, no one really had an answer. Curtis was crowned victor of the debate. Most people think it was primarily because he was a good orator. And then came October the 6th, 6th October, 1923. And you can see here, this was the A-part for October 6th, 2023. So what we're looking at here is something that is over 100 years old. Edwin Hubble is working at the, the Wilson Observatory, the observatory in Mount Wilson, the same observatory that Shackley did his research um, in distance determine the whole thing about Milky Ways. And Hubble looked at this, and this was off a, a one of the nebulae. That was what they were called at that time. It was Nebulae Andromeda. Some of you may already know where this is called heading. 
that he was looking at one, at one of these nebulae and he compared two photographic plates of his. This is what we're looking at, the photographic plates. So M, M31 here. And he noticed something. First, he marked M, um, this referring to, to, to nebulae. But he noticed that there was a difference between the two plates. A variable star was, a, 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 a variable was what he had found. Hence the marking VAR, exclamation mark. And he was so excited because when he did the calculations, he determined that whatever that thing was, it was too far away to have been in the same galaxy as the Milky Way. This was the first conclusive evidence that there were things outside the Milky Way. Today, you ask a five, six-year-old, he can tell you that stars go into galaxies. But this, this was the plate that proved there were galaxies outside of our own Milky Way. That's why we call it here, Edwin Hubble discovers the universe. At that time, a lot of people just thought it was all in the Milky Way. He showed, nope, the Milky Way is just one. There are so, so, so many other Milky Ways, the closest of which was Andromeda. This was the plate that proved it. This was the plate that solved the great debate of Shapley and Curtis. This was the debate. This was the plate that put to rest the question of whether our Milky Way was the only one or whether we had brothers, sisters, cousins, millions of light years away. And the answer to that question was yes. Our Milky Way is not alone. It's just one of many. Now, that is why uh, Einstein really respected, I use the word Pape, eh? the Edwin Hubble, because this is a minor discovery for, for uh, Einstein. That is, he discovered that there are those, uh, those nebulae that are actually galaxies that are far away from the Milky Way. That's, that's why they found that the universe is not only the stars in one universe, our galaxy, but many other uh, galaxies. The bigger discovery was, it was also Edwin Hubble discovered the rich shift of the galaxy the expansion of the universe that proved yep. that Einstein to be wrong, all right? Einstein hoped for a static universe, but Hubble discovered by observation that the universe is expanding. And again, Einstein was very impressed by that then discovery. Really respected Edwin Hubble, Einstein, yeah. And, and Ed, I mean, Edwin Hubble is one of the real greats in terms of astronomy. Some of you, if you're not familiar with Edwin Hubble, you may, it may seem as if the Hubble name is very familiar, that's because it is after Edwin Hubble that the Hubble Space Telescope was named. So yes, Edwin Hubble was truly one of the greats in terms of astronomers. That basically wraps up this, this A part, a monumental plate and one that will forever, forever be remembered as changing the course of astronomy. No, I will add on, uh, we are, I, I have been waiting for some years, what? Another repeat of this discovery, not by Edwin Hubble, but a future astronomer on the planet Earth, where on a kind of plate or something, he made a discovery that our universe that we know is not the only universe. The many so-called predicted parallel universe also exist. We're heading, waiting for this discovery. Right now, this is Hubble discovered that our Milky Way is not the only galaxy. There are many other galaxies. He found that the universe is much bigger than expected. But now we are hoping for experimental evidence that our universe it's not the only one. The other parallel universe exists with scientific discovery. We hope so in future. Right? That would be an even more yeah. uni universe shaking, universe breaking. Yes, yes. Not a shaking, universe yeah. shaking. Yeah, universe shaking. <laughs> thank you. So I continue. Uh, thank you, Rayan. Okay, I share my screen. Eighth of October. Okay, you see that? The plane, eighth of October, the plane, clouds, moon, spots, and sun. It's by our Mr. Doyle and Shannon Striper. Okay, uh, it's a husband and wife team from America, all right? And they are from the 
uh, Urbana, uh, Champaign Urbana Astronomical Society, Illinois, USA. Okay, where's the plane? There, there you are the plane. So that means during a, a, a what they call a partial solar eclipse. All right, uh, they took a picture of the eclipse partial page of the sun, where you have the aeroplane there. All right, and then you have the clouds there. You are the clouds on the Earth's atmosphere. Okay, clouds also in the Earth's atmosphere. Sunspot. There you are, a sunspot globe. Our AR2122 sunspot. And of course, you have the, the moon there. Okay, the, the black silhouette of the moon. Okay, plain clouds, moon, sunspot. So now this is another example, uh, Dr. Jiva and Ray, is timing. So in astronomy, we always know that a good picture also depends on luck, you know, and the luck is at the correct time and the uh, uh, exact place you can do it. And no total uh, cloud to cover the whole event. So its timing is very, very important and they got it, all right? So this is our uh, plane, clouds, moon, spots, and sun, okay? So we go to the next one, which is 7th of October. Wow. The once and future stars of Andromeda, okay? We go back to the... To the caption first is NASA, NSF, National Science Foundation, USA. And there's a misspelling here. NOAJ is wrong. Should be NAOJ, National Astronomical Observatory of Japan. No, the Japanese are very proud that the largest Earth based telescope, Subaru telescope, is based next to the Keck telescope on Mount Nakia in, uh, in uh, what they call uh, in, in uh, Hawaii. So the, the Japanese Subaru telescope, 8.2 meter single mirror telescope. It's next to the famous twin cake, the two 10 meter optical telescope next to each other. All right. And AOJ, and this Hubble picture. Okay, Hubble we know is 2.4 meter uh, aperture. And then Subaru telescope is 8.2 meter aperture. And the Mayan telescope in uh, what they call Kitt Peak National Observatory in Arizona, which is a 4 meter telescope. And DSS is the Digital Sky Survey. And the Spitzer telescope. Spitzer telescope is about 0.85 meter. It's sent to space in infrared. So long before you have James Webb Space Telescope, there are already infrared telescopes in space. And Spitzer is one of them, although it's not so big, 0.85 meters. All right? Whereas James Webb Space Telescope is 6.5 meters, but observing infrared. And processing is by our famous Robert Gendler and Russell Crowman. I've been following these two guys for many years. They are well-known American uh, internationally known amateur astrophotographer. There are many, many uh, pictures and books written by them. So it's uh, the Andromeda taken from Earth by all those optical telescopes I mentioned earlier and by Spitzer. This is in uh, infrared. So now you see it's in optical wavelength by all those telescopes I mentioned earlier. And this by Spitzer in infrared. So we know that what's the advantage of the infrared telescope? Is, remember, the infrared telescope is observing at longer wavelength than optical. And they have longer wavelength, that means, uh, imagine I have a dust particle the size of the optical wavelength. And the dust particle is lying between the center of the Andromeda and Earth. And that visible light part, uh, photon is hit the dust particle, and the size of the dust particle is bigger than the light particle, light, uh, the wavelength of the light photon. So that dust particle will absorb the light. So that means, the, the dust particle will block the light from the inner part of Andromeda galaxy. That's visible. Short, short wavelength. Short wavelength are blocked by the dust particle. But this is infrared. Because the infrared wavelength are longer. So we know from physics that if the wavelength of the electromagnetic wave is, is longer than the diameter of the particle, the infrared wavelength will pass through space as if the particle is not there. But the particle cannot absorb, okay, a, a wavelength that is longer than the particle size. So that means using infrared wavelength, we can see the infrared light from the stars in the inner part of Andromeda cross, pass through the, the dust cloud and coming towards the Earth. So you can see the dust cloud. And we know that the dust cloud here is where the new stars will be born. Why? Because the stars, like our sun, were born from the protosolar nebula. Basically, it's a gas and dust uh, uh, nebula, which is in three dimension. But we collapse to a pancake. It must always collapse to a pancake to call the accretion disk. And from there, our sun and the planets are born. So basically, you have this 
uh, what they call this uh, 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 dust lanes here, and every and many of them will collapse to form protosolar nebula and stars will form. Even the Andromeda galaxy, there, there, before the Andromeda galaxy was formed, there was also a protosolar galactic nebula. So after many years, the the three dimensional uh, 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 what they call cloud of gas and that will collapse to a pancake because according to the law of gravity. The three-dimensional sphere of gas and that must collapse, collapse to a pancake, much smaller, and that pancake must rotate very fast. That's why Andromeda is rotating. So originally, this was a three-dimensional cloud, collapsed to a much smaller object, called this, uh, what they call the disk of the Andromeda galaxy, and this is seen in visible light, and this is seen in the infrared, all right? And when you see infrared, you can peer through the inner part of the Andromeda galaxy, and there you have the satellite galaxy of Andromeda, all right? So this is the once and future stars of Andromeda, right? And like what uh, uh, what they call uh, Dr. Jiva mentioned earlier, so we are on the date, a uh, dangerous date, uh, uh, Rayan. Andromeda and Earth will, and the Milky Way will collide. But don't worry, in the future, five billion years from now, Bangkok, <laughs> five thousand million years from now. All right. So please be happy for another five billion years. Okay, you uh, Earth wings on the Earth, and so many. If we believe that. The, the, the scientists said that every star in Milky Way must have an exoplanet. So how many stars in Milky Way? 200 billion stars. So if one star got one planet, that means 200 billion exoplanets with many, many alien civilizations. So enjoy your, your Milky Way's lifetime for another 5 billion years before we combine together in future. All right? I would like that. It's really nice. All right? This is once and future stars of Andromeda Galaxy. Now, October the 5th, the next one. Another uh, solar eclipse, uh, Rayan, Dr. Jiva. Okay. Okay. The ring of fire over Monument Valley by our famous Mr. Tung Tezel. I don't know how to present Mr. in, in, in Turkish. Turkish uh. He's a famous Turkish amateur astronomer by Tuan. Tuan is the famous the world at night. I hope our musician can post this picture. Many years ago, our famous amateur ast astrophotographer, amateur astronomer, Barbara Tafleshi from Iran set up a group, amateur group called The World at Night, all around the world. And this group doesn't take pictures with telescope. They take the camera with Milky Way. All right? So basically, Tung Fezel, this Turkish uh, astro astrophotographer, went to our Monument Valley. Remember Monument Valley? It's a place where they always have the cowboy movie. Remember the monument here? Cowboy movie? And the famous... The what they call uh, once upon a time in the West. Remember our what they call Charles Bronson, the movie uh, Monument Valley, where all the cowboy movies are they, uh, given. So basically, that was on October uh, 14, the recent annular solar eclipse, and this is a ring of fire. Okay, and this is is in the uh, let me see here yeah, because it's October one should be in the morning. So this is looking at the. In the morning, in the morning sky, towards uh, in, in the morning sky, but looking at the western direction, all right, and you see the rising sun, and right in the center you have uh, and that's it. You can see the ring of fire in the center. Then the ring of fire here, all right, and then they told me went up. So after, so you know between one exposure to the to the next many minutes, all right. So when they're very nice, and what I like is he must have went them a few days earlier to find the the best location. Monument Valley and so on. Except that he should have uh do put an extra, he should have sat there on a the horse and he with a cowboy hat take a picture there. Right. In the oh, that would be nice, All right? So it is a ring of fire over Monument Valley on the border of state of Utah and Arizona. Okay, the recent uh annual solar eclipse in America, so he was there. The last one will be for October the second. This is our famous Sprite. There you are. Sprite lightning in high definition. Now, Sprite, I don't know whether, Rayan, you remember, many years ago, and I like it also, in Malaysia, we have the Sprite drink, you know. It's something like 7-Up seven, uh, seven drink, but it's not 7-Up, yeah. it's oh, called Sprite. Yeah. Yeah. It's a gassy drink, huh? colorless, very popular. I saw, uh, took it at the time I like, but now I don't take it because gassy drink and sugar are not so good. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so this guy, Nicholas Escura, remember his uh, fresh man eh, taking this picture from Dordogne in the Western France, all right? 
So in in you know, Malaysians are not good in pronouncing names. I'm not trying to be too fussy about this. But sometimes I hear our Malaysian, even our newscaster on TV reading the European name. Oh, I get the shiver, you know. So this is Nicola Escura. The first word S is silent. The second word T is silent. So Nicola Escura. So he was there. And this is taken very, very fast. One upon 25 seconds. One zero zero four seconds. He took it, right? So this instant he took, he was lucky. The next moment, no more already. So what is Sprite? Not a drink. Huh? Sprite is a form of upper atmosphere lightning. So in other words that, you have electric charges built up in the Earth's atmosphere, very high up in the Earth's atmosphere, actually extending to above 100 kilometers. Above 100 kilometers means into space already. And he was there in Dordogne, maybe by chance, he opened his camera shutter, or maybe, like we say, some camera, your DSR card, DSR can take multiple shots. Like you see in the position in front of the reporter, they, chat, 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 they take they take very fast, a, a series of shots, and in one of the shot, he got the sprite of the set. So basically, you have uh, you have uh, the charge on the Earth, the Earth surface also got charge, and in the upper atmosphere, there's also electric charge, and when they join together, you have all these like fingers sticking down, and this is not small, you know, can be many, many kilometers in height, and in space also. And on top also, you see this blob of discharge also. But the next moment, he took this picture, the next moment, it was not there. So he was lucky. So, and by the way, Sprite was only confirmed to have been um, photographed in 1986, only recently. And now, actually, it's occurred all over the world. So guys, listen, when you take a picture of astrophotography, Dr. Jiwa, especially with your wide angle shot, huh, with, your, with your DSLR, make sure you look out for Sprite. Uh, in Penang also, sprites also have been observed, okay? So this is called the Sprite Lightning Upper Atmospheric Phenomena, all right? Taken by Nicola Escura in Dordogne in France, okay? So I think that's all for today, uh, for me, all right? So maybe we can have some final comments and maybe, sorry, yeah, Michael can find out for us uh, any, any question on our Facebook and YouTube channel. Um, I think, Dr. Chong, yeah. uh, just one comment. If you look at Rayan's uh, presentation on Hubble Discovers the Universe, hmm. that is a plate of Andromeda Galaxy, yes, taken yes. in 1923. Hmm. <laughs> look at what oh. uh, discovered, what they had to work with those days. Yeah. So because it's like you know, that, just, yeah, before it's that... Smudge, it's just a smudge. Smudged yeah. with some faint lines, and uh, you know, they had to practically, I think, use their imagination to identify individual stars compared to what we are able to do now with our amateur equipment. Yeah, so basically, the, uh, the discovery is made like that because already, like you mentioned, uh, uh, uh Dr. Jiwa, also Henrietta Levy, American woman astronomer in the early 20th century, already found out the selfie variable, very star name after her, all right. Selfie variable by Henry Tell David. And, uh, and the Selfie variable has a, a prop, uh, the thing that the longer the period of variability, all right, the more luminous it is, absolute yes. luminosity. And remember, when you know the absolute luminosity, and you, know you also, in other words, you know the absolute magnitude already by measuring the period of the variability, you also know the apparent magnitude by observing what you can see. Say, uh, that star, you plot it in the the luminosity period relation, okay, you know the absolute magnitude, you plug into the Poxon's equation, which relate the luminosity, the magnitude, with the distance. And they found that that CLP variable in Andrew Gaza is 2 million light years away, 2 million light years away, which was bigger than the size of the Milky Way. So then they will say that, what's the, what's the obvious conclusion? That object where the star is lying is a galaxy, similar to our Milky Way. And once you discover the Andromeda galaxy, then the whole Pandora box has been opened. The floodgates are open. There are galaxy, galaxy, galaxy. Every nebula is a galaxy. But not every single nebula is a galaxy. But many of the galaxies, nebula will confirm to be galaxies. That's how it did. The big discovery, you know? Big discovery, okay? And on the topic of the photographic plate, I remember listening to a documentary about relativity some time ago. And when they were describing the work that uh, Eddington had to do, 
changing plates continuously as they were observing the eclipse. It's just wow. And it's been less than, I mean, at most, maybe a century, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. Since then, we have progressed so, so far. And then, you know, uh, Ryan and Dr. Jiwa, the cycle of astronomical dis discovery has always ups and downs, downs and up. you know. Remember, Einstein came out with general theory of relativity in 1915 when he was 35 years old. And in his field equation, uh, this equation that that in that single equation, you can describe the whole universe, you know. And there's a lambda of cosmological concern that because according to Einstein, he assumed that gravity is always attractive. But according to the general uh, the cosmological the, the equation, the universe is not stable. It's either contract, the galaxy will contract, will expand. So to make it, uh, uh, what they call, safe for Einstein, he put a lambda concern to make the universe static. Doesn't expand, doesn't contract. And then some years later, uh, uh, what they call Hubble discovered the universe is expanding. Then Hubble made the famous statement that was his biggest blunder in, the, in his life. He already uh, yeah. come up with this equation. Okay, he shouldn't have put in lambda. That means he could have predicted the expansion of the universe, but he was scared. Nobody invented the universe expanding. He was scared, so he added in a concern to make the universe static. And now, now the the it has come full cycle. Remember now. Uh, they have this thing called dark energy. Remember, astronomers have confirmed that in the universe, four percent normal matter, the atoms in you and me, in the chair you're sitting on, in the stars we see, all right, and about about uh, twenty over percent is the dark matter, and uh, and sixty over percent is the dark energy. So dark energy is the but it's the thing in the universe that makes expansion of the universe. Dark energy is repulsive, all right. So now they are bringing into paper that is dark energy. So Einstein was uh, correct after all. He, if he had not put in the lambda to make the universe concern, and then he was scared because the universe was static, he put in, he was wrong. But then now we found that Einstein was correct after all. There, there's anti, no, there's actually that energy makes the universe expand. So up and down, Einstein was correct after all. Ah, yeah, correct. All right, then. Huh? Any other comments? Uh, no. Yeah. Okay, so uh, thanks to everyone for watching. Thanks to Dr. Jiva Rush Nadaraja and our our Mr. Ryan Akadri. All right, so we wait for the next one's uh, November uh, airport uh, presentation. All right, and so we look forward to our coming events done by our Associate Society of Penang, and we hope that uh, Ryan and Dr. Jiva can join us. All right, it's coming up a lot of events, and we are now waiting, waiting for December what? December fifteen. German is a shower, all right? So we may go to a dark area. I don't know whether it's or ability to observe for that, all right? And also now, Dr. Jiva and uh, uh, Rihanna, uh, recently we have our member, uh, Inche Juzali Asmi. He's a geophysical engineer with his own company now, a former USM student years ago, president of the Ast Ast Astronic Club of USM. I know him for many years. He knew of our big star party held in USM in 2005. Uh, that final night, star party, 5,000 people with Dr. Jiva, don't fall down from a chair, 138 telescope, big and small. The largest yeah. in the 16 inch, me, Smith Castle Dream. Right? We, we were there. So now he tried to find support from uh, important people, and ASP will support him. He hopefully will do a big star party next year in June or July in Lake Timataso in Police. And we hope the set. Another book of record. Remember in 2005, the governor of Penang was in USM. He signed on the Malaysia book record, largest star party in Malaysia, 138 telescope. So we want to break it. Uh, and remember, uh, before he retired in 2015, I think two years earlier, 2013, one Nani, an events manager from KL, came to Penang. Hey, yo, USM uh, organized a big star party in 2005. How you organize? They gave all of idea. And I think one year later, 2014, we were in Palace of Justice in Putrajaya. Himpunan Jutaan Belia. Many events, and that night we bring a big star party behind the Palace of Jassi. I remember I counted about 11 p.m., about 100 telescope. But some or other, they, they put into the Malaysia Book of Record because the, the officer of the Malaysia Book of Record <laughs> left early. So, Port Nani put in 153 telescope. So, our USM record was broken. Look at me, I'm not happy. <laughs> you want to set a new record. So, for the past many years, 
We hope to break the record, but we hope to have good support, funding, and so on. A big star party. Lake Tima Tasco. Everyone will be, will, be, will be invited. And Dr. Jiwa, how many telescopes you still have? And the one you donate to society will, will bring up. Because you say, no, I only can. Don't worry. Many of our AFP members, many of them are capable to run your telescope. But during the star party, you bring the whole set, plus the set you know, to, uh, that this is my telescope. Wow, every people impressed. Wow, Dr. Jiwa, thanks to you. Uh, bring your whole set of telescope. And Rayan also, please come. Next year, June, July, okay? Big star party, hopefully the biggest one ever done in Indonesia. Huh? Okay. So, uh, Michael, any any question? Uh? Okay, huh? Okay. So, any final comments, uh, Dr. Jiva, Rayan? No. Okay. no. So, thanks again to the both of you. <laughs> and thanks to Michael for singing. Uh, Michael and uh, me have been running this program for so many times. So, now pay attention to James Webb. A lot of discoveries are coming in James Webb. And just to let you yes. know, I, I don't know whether you are keen, only this afternoon, myself, Dr. John Su, uh, Kenny Lowe, and Dr. John Su, a final year physics student, they have formed a group called Start the James Webb Space Telescope Universe. So a lot of discoveries coming in. We try to look at the James Webb Space Telescope pictures, spectrum, and so on. See whether we can do some research on James Webb Space Telescope data. If you want, you can join in. Okay? Okay. Well, thank you very much to everyone here. Thank you. Thank See you, you again. Thanks for watching.